Please welcome Simon Ault. Thank you very much, and um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me to your lovely city. I would like to um, tell you, in English, I'm afraid, um, the story of three indexes. Um, I'm not really an academic, but I do love measuring things. I have a kind of obsession for measuring things. And I realized when I was preparing this talk that it's actually quite logical for me to tell the story of my working career uh, as a series of measurements. So um, I'm going to uh, do exactly that. First water. Oh, we're not at the beginning. There we are, that's me. It all started in 1998 when I made the biggest mistake of my professional career, um, which was to coin a very unfortunate term. And the, uh, the term was nation brand. The paper that I wrote in this journal, the Journal of Brand Management, was called Nation Brands of the 21st Century. And uh, in this paper, what I was talking about was something really very simple. It seemed to me that we had entered into the age of advanced globalization. And in this period of history, suddenly every country is competing with every other country for tourists, for investment, for talent, for attention. The trouble is that this supermarket of countries is a very big one. There are nearly 200 countries in the world. And most of the people who are shopping for tourism, or for investment, or for culture, or for jobs, or whatever it is, don't know anything about most of those countries, because there are too many. And in a situation like that, where you don't know much about the real nature of the product that you're buying, you tend to fall back on your prejudices and your preconceptions. And so my argument was that in the uh, 21st century, which was just about to start when I wrote this uh, paper, the images of countries had become almost more important than the reality, simply because people didn't know the reality. And when you don't know the reality, the image becomes everything. Now, I should explain that this didn't make me very happy. I thought it was rather sad that the nation state which is a very interesting political, geographical, sociological, anthropological construct, should have been reduced by the modern age to nothing more than a brand. And in fact, when I used the term nation brand, I was being ironic. Big mistake. Never try to be ironic in an academic paper. <laughs> um, the consequence, unfortunately, was that everybody thought I was being absolutely serious. And what happened was that that term nation brand very quickly, without me noticing it, began to change from nation brand into nation branding. Now you may say, what difference can three letters possibly make? But they do, they make a, dig a big difference. And so the first part of my story is the story that leads up to the first index, and it's all about those three letters. Now, what is nation branding anyway? Um, this is what it's not. I feel I have to show this slide because a student of mine designed it and she put so many days of work into it. I just feel sorry that that effort should be wasted. And I think it's beautiful. It's a very, very good illustration of exactly how ridiculous the idea of nation branding is. That you take a country and you try to turn it into a consumer product. And you might say, this is surely just a joke, right? No government, no serious person could possibly imagine that this has got anything to do with logos. Could you? And yet, there is in existence something which I call the Crayola School of Nation Branding, which says, if you take the name of your country or your city or your region, and you design a new logo with as many colored crayons as you can possibly buy in the shop, 
then somehow this will mysteriously change the image of your old country. Now, that's one slide. I actually have seven slides just like that. I won't show them all to you because it would become repetitive. But isn't it extraordinary? There are several extraordinary things about that slide. Right? The first and most extraordinary thing about it is that this design approach manages to make places which are so different look exactly the same. I mean, could you imagine two more different places than Zambia and Nicaragua? And yet, lo and behold, they have the same logo. Sometimes I wonder, when I'm about to fall asleep at night, if in fact there isn't some incredible business scam going on here, that there's one design agency with one idea and branches in every city all around the world, and they've sold this idea to hundreds of governments claiming that it's unique. And you can see why they think this is a great idea, because the conversation is always the same. They say, we know how incredibly wonderful and diverse and colorful and rich and beautiful we are as a city, as a region, as a country. But every time we research it, we find that people don't know that. If only they knew, if only they knew how wonderful we really are, then they would come here as tourists. They would invest. They would want to live here. They would talk more positively about us. I know, if we write the name of our city with a different color for every letter, then they'll realize, won't they? No, they won't. My approach has always been an approach not based on communications. I actually do not believe that it is possible to change the image of anything through communications. I would go further than that. This thing, this monster called nation branding, which seems to suggest that if you want to change the image of a city or a country, it's just a question of messaging. Well, there's another term for that. It's called propaganda. Propaganda is when you send out messages in order to deliberately manipulate people's perceptions without bothering to change the reality. And you know what? It doesn't work. One of the wonderful things about the 21st century, this globalized world that we live in, is that it has made propaganda virtually impossible. It's almost impossible. Propaganda only works when you control all the channels of communication reaching your audience. So if you are Kim Jong-un, or Joseph Stalin, or Joseph Goebbels for that matter, you can do propaganda because your people only have access to one version of the truth, and that's your version. And if you tell them that version and nothing else, eventually they will probably give up and they'll believe it because there's no other story available. But internationally, that's never been possible. Indeed, as I often say, if nation branding were really possible, then we, my friends, would be living in the Third Reich today, not the European Union, because nobody understood nation branding better than Joseph Goebbels. The fact of the matter is that when you try to force people around the world to believe something about a country, they will either ignore you, that's the most likely thing, or else they will resist, and they will tell as many counter stories as they possibly can. So my personal view, which I admit has become a little bit hardened over the years, is that governments that spend taxpayers' money on propaganda messages trying to tell the world how cool and fantastic and wonderful and attractive and glorious they are should not just not be in government, they should be in prison because it doesn't work. And for the last 20 years, I've been looking for one single properly researched case study of a single country or region or city that has demonstrably managed to change its public image through messages and I'm still looking. I haven't found one anywhere. Now, call me old-fashioned, but I think if you're spending taxpayers' money on anything at all, it should be measurable, transparent, and accountable. You need a model. You need to say, we're doing this because some other country did it before, and it worked. But I never get that response from governments. They say, we're doing it because everybody does it. Well, that's a little bit like the logic of saying you should eat dog poo because 300 trillion flies can't be wrong. The fact of the matter is that there is no model that demonstrates that it works. There are plenty of examples to show that governments do this, but they never measure the results so they can never prove that it functions. So that's the difference between nation brand, 
which is just an observation about the importance of image, and nation branding, which sounds like a trick or a technique for changing the image. I don't think that such a technique exists. And if it does, it's certainly nothing to do with communications or logos or slogans, but it may have something to do with policies. So I um, wrote a book a few years ago called Competitive Identity, and the reason I'm showing it to you is because that phrase was my desperate and failed attempt to replace the awful phrase nation branding with something a little bit more intelligent. And in one respect, it succeeded because I wanted something that was less sexy than nation branding. I succeeded. Competitive identity is certainly less sexy than nation branding. It failed because nobody uses the expression, well, one or two governments do. This is a fascinating subject, and I've spent um, a great many years exploring it, researching it, and advising governments on it. Um, it's enough material for many more books than the ones that I've written about it. People around the world are fascinated by the subject. The media is fascinated by the subject. It's very much a subject for the age that we live in. This absolute fascination with image and its relationship to reality. It even has its own uh, scholarly field. I founded this uh, academic publication now 11 years ago, and it's still published every quarter. And academics around the world are still writing papers about national image and city image and regional image. And the funny thing is that all of them write all of their papers based on the assumption that there is actually a field <laughs> called place branding. And they're all wrong because there isn't. It simply doesn't exist. It's a collective hallucination, which I feel partly responsible for. Oh, uh, the only reason why these slides are here is because I want you to be impressed by how many governments I've advised. It's 53 um, so far. And the reason I put them there is because I would like you to understand that when I talk about this subject, it is as a result of having got really quite close to the bottom of it having actually advised 53 governments, usually at the level of president or prime minister, having done research for uh, lots of countries and cities, and having read lots and lots and lots of academic papers. And so when I say to you that I think that this is an illusion, I hope that you will give that some weight, because it's taken me 15 years to figure out that it's an illusion. But the question that people ask is quite a logical question. They say, why? Does image matter anyway? Well, I think that image does matter. And in the first part of my exploration into this subject, one of the things that I really wanted to do was to find evidence that image is important for places. And the evidence has now been accumulated, not just by me, but by many others. Um, here, for example, is a paper that was written um, three years ago at Drexel University, which shows if you improve the reputation of a given country in another country by one place, they're talking about my Nation Brands Index here, which I will introduce you to in a moment, leads to a 2% increase in exports to that target country, equivalent to a tariff decrease of nearly 4%. Now that's quite significant. Those are small figures, but um, they are sometimes very, very large sums of money. So basically what this paper is saying is that if you improve your image very slightly, you will enjoy an enormous increase uh, in, uh, in exports to the other country. This is what's called the country of origin effect. Made in Hungary is probably worth more at this point in time than uh, made in Djibouti, but probably less than made in Japan. And that scale of perceived value makes a gigantic difference to the premium at which you can sell your exports. Here's another one. Now, this one... The claim is so striking that at first I didn't believe it when the paper was submitted. We find that the Anhalt Nation Brands Index, our measure for intangibles, by which they mean intangible value or goodwill, in the host country has a large positive effect on foreign direct investment. A one-point increase in the index is associated with a 27% increase in the flow of inward foreign direct investment. This is absolutely staggering. What they're saying is, you improve your image by one point, not even one place in the index, one point, and you will enjoy 27% increase in foreign direct investment. That could literally change the fortunes of a country, a nearly one-third increase in FDI. Now, when we first received this paper, we are so skeptical about it that we asked the authors to go back 
and substantiate their findings. And they did, and we were still not satisfied. The editorial board said, if we publish this, nobody will believe it because the numbers are just too big. So with great good humor, um, they went back to the uh, Max Planck Institute and the OECD, and they got it revered, uh, reviewed and, um, and, and double-checked, and in the end, we felt we had to publish it. This is a staggering figure, and it suggests that image really is a very, very significant and tangible uh, element in the life of a nation, certainly in its economic life. And I guess this was the point of departure uh, for me, the understanding, and this is what I said in my original paper, that today governments need to be brand managers as much as they are policy makers because they are responsible for the good name of their nation. And the good name of their nation is their license to trade and their ability to be competitive. Here's another one which I don't believe. A 10% increase in your country's reputation leads to an 11% rise in your tourism receipts. The reason I don't believe it is because I think those numbers are too small. I think if you really did mm -hmm. actually create a 10% increase in your reputation, you'd probably double or triple your tourism uh, um, arrivals. But the Reputation Institute don't explain their methodology, so I have no way of checking it. And the evidence is growing. There are more and more papers published on this subject every year. What National Image does to export performance, it makes diplomacy easier, it makes attracting students easier, which is terribly important, as we know, attracting foreign direct investment, attracting tourists, attracting major sporting events, major cultural events. It seems that whatever area you're interested in, the countries that have got a good and powerful and positive image will get more business and they'll get it at a higher margin. The countries that have a weak and negative image will not. And so from this was born a very simple model which tried to understand how national image works. And this is the simple model, that basically all countries communicate their image, their reputation to the rest of the world, or somehow uh, transfer it to the rest of the world through these six natural channels. Most of the time they don't realize they're doing it. But you've got the exports at the top, those are the products. So to give you a very simple example, most of what we believe today about Germany has come to us through German products. The reason why uh, we think Germans are efficient uh, is because we know about BMW and Siemens and Bosch and IG and Mercedes and Volkswagen. <laughs> Do you know what? I ordered a Tesla Model S last week, so I don't care. Um, I've, been, I've been called by about 79 journalists in the past two weeks asking me if the Volkswagen fiasco is going to damage the image of Germany. And the answer is no, of course not. The image of Germany is a gigantic cultural construct. Humanity believes that Germans make the rules, they don't break the rules. So they will perceive the Volkswagen fiasco as an anomaly and it will prove to them what they already believe. I know this because this happened before when Toyota got into terrible scandals for making dangerous cars and then refusing to admit it. In my index, I found it didn't have any impact on the image of Japan at all. It was bad for Toyota, temporarily, but it didn't affect the image of Japan. People want to continue to believe that Germans are great, and they want to continue to believe that German cars are great. It's not easy to make people change their minds, even if you try really, really hard, as Volkswagen have been doing. Um, so there are the products, the governance, the way that we believe that the country behaves in international relations, particularly. What is its perceived commitment to the environment, to human rights, and things like that? Culture is tremendously important. If we believe that a country has got a rich and vibrant cultural heritage, we're more likely to respect it as a country. If we believe it doesn't have one, then we won't respect it so much. And one of the interesting uh, tragedies of the Soviet Union was that effectively the countries that were within the Soviet Union, what we in my country used to call the uh, Eastern Bloc, the countries behind the wall, the memory of their individual cultures was effectively erased from human memory for 75 years. And so when the wall came down in 19, 1989, the rest of the world had to rediscover from the beginning that each of those countries, Hungary and all the rest of them, actually had culture because for 75 years it had been concealed from us. And this was a crime of enormous proportions because it effectively took away those countries' abilities to compete and to feature 
in their own true selves on the international stage. Most of them have got it back again now, and particularly quick in the case of the countries like uh, Hungary, which are lucky enough to have beautiful cities, because of course tourists are attracted to those cities and people quickly learn once again that these are countries with a strong individual culture. The countries from the ex-Soviet Union that don't have beautiful cities uh, that attract tourists have found that job of reinventing themselves much more difficult and much slower. Um, and then we've got the people, of course, critically important. That could be ordinary people, but it could also be famous people. Part of the image of my country, the United Kingdom today, is created by people like Margaret Thatcher and Winston Churchill and David Beckham and Elton John. Of course, because we human beings, we personify countries. And it's much <coughs> easier for us to understand a country if we think of it in terms of a famous person from that country. Some years ago, I co-wrote a book with Jeremy Hildreth called Brand America, and we devoted several pages to talking about how Benjamin Franklin created the image of America in France, where he was ambassador. And the French at the time said over and over again, if the Americans are anything like this extraordinary man, then we're on the wrong side in the War of Independence, and they changed their side as a result of the figure of Benjamin Franklin, which came to represent Americans to them. What would be the image of South Africa today if it hadn't been for Nelson Mandela? What would we think about Burma if we didn't think of Aung San Suu Kyi? What would we think about Brazil if we didn't think of Lula da Silva? So these individuals have the power to brand, I don't like the word, but to give an image to the country. And it can be negative as well, of course, that goes without saying. But it can also be ordinary people, it can be your diaspora. For example, if you're Ireland or Scotland or Turkey and you have millions of uh, members of your diaspora living abroad, they also act as ambassadors for your country, whether you like it or not. And one of the things that my research has shown me is that in Europe, in all the countries where there are the largest number of Turkish expatriates, the image of Turkey is the most negative. It's not their fault, but the impact of those migrants has created a worsening of the image of their home country. You find a similar effect in the United States, where you've got perhaps 11 million Mexicans living and working. They are a gigantic force for creating the image of the country. <coughs> Tourism is obviously critically important. The Tourist Board is the only body really in a nation that is allowed to tell people about that country. And one of the critical things that the Tourist Board can do is it can show images of the country. It can show people that it's beautiful. And as I will explain a little bit later on, the perception that a country looks good, that it's actually beautiful and attractive, is really important to our understanding of its overall image. And then finally, Im immigration and investment. This is, if you like, the business-to-business -business area. This is where countries promote to specialized expert audiences for uh, investment opportunities and where they're trying to attract uh, high-level, talented immigrants, researchers, uh, and so on and so forth. Through these six channels, the image of the nation is somehow created, but over many, many, many years. So, on the basis of that hexagon, we finally reach my first index. And this is an index that I launched, originally not with GFK Roper. Uh, GFK Roper came along uh, and helped me from uh, 2008. Um, and uh, I must say that it's improved a great deal since they've been helping me. Um, based on the hexagon, what I wanted to do was I wanted to measure the images of nations because there was no data available. There was lots of data that measured what countries actually did, but there was nothing that measured what people thought about them. And so I thought, well, I'd better do it myself. So I got together with a company in the United States called GMI, and we started to measure. And this is where we are today. Between 2005 and 2007, I ran this study, it's an international poll, uh, every quarter, every three months. And after um, a very short time, I realized that I created the most boring survey ever invented, because basically it never changed. One of the things I wanted to find out was whether uh, the images of countries change at all regularly. And I discovered after the first few iterations of this index that actually they don't. So uh, in uh, 2008, when uh, I partnered with GFK, rather gratefully, we started doing it every year because there's just no point in doing it every three months. 
Every year, we speak to somewhere between 20,000 and 38,000 people in 20 or 28 countries. That represents, statistically speaking, about 66% of the world's population, or 70% of the world's economy, if you, if you go by their spending power. We look at 50 target countries, and the partner index, the City Brands Index, or CBI, we're looking at uh, 50 cities in the same way. We ask 50 questions, and uh, that's quite a big questionnaire. We're asking a lot of very, very detailed questions of people, trying to measure their perceptions of these different countries. We're asking about every point of the hexagon. We're asking about their perceptions of the culture, the people, the industry, the landscape, and so forth. Um, a Canadian academic wrote to me a couple of years ago and pointed out to me that this had now become the world's third or fourth largest social survey. And I said, what, you mean in measuring image? And he said, no the world's third or fourth largest social survey ever conducted. It's a monster. I mean, that's uh, nearly 300 billion data points. Um, and the fact that there's so much data in there, and I get so little time ever to look at it, was the main reason why the third index came along, but I'll come on to that in a moment. So on that point about national image fluctuating, does it? Well, there's your answer, no. That's the United Kingdom, my country. During a particularly exciting period in world history, uh, between the third quarter of 2005 and the fourth quarter of 2007, those are the different components of the UK's image, and as you can see, nothing happened. Well, actually, that's not quite true. Something sort of did happen between uh, quarter three 2006 and quarter one 2007. In some areas, there was a bit of a, a bit of a hump. And I spent a very happy six weeks going through every single newspaper and website I could find from that period to try to figure out what had happened that made the world mildly more positive about Britain and then change its mind again. And you know what? I couldn't find anything. Nothing. It was just random. It's just a random fluctuation. It doesn't mean a thing. And most countries, from year to year, that's what you see. They never, ever, ever change. The images of countries are, as I said before, gigantic, robust, cultural constructs which are shared by millions of people. We learn them as we grow up. We imbibe them through the culture. They're not created by the media. They're not created by movies. The media and movies add to them a little bit, but they're not created by those. They're huge, and they really, really, really don't change. If you want to, you can try very, very hard to damage them. You have to try a lot harder than Volkswagen did to damage its own image. But then again, the United States of America has been trying to destroy its own image since about 1800, and it still hasn't succeeded. It's still the most admired country on Earth. Some people say, but surely if you host the Olympics, that makes a huge difference to your image. Well, don't worry too much about this slide. I'll explain it. Um, I was lucky enough to be able to measure the image of the United Kingdom just before the 2012 Olympics and just afterwards, which was wonderful to be able to test actually in the laboratory whether a highly successful major event would make a difference to the image of the country. And I think the 2012 Olympics in London was generally agreed to be a great success. Now, what you see down the left-hand side there is some of the individual questions in the questionnaire. At the top, on the left-hand side, you see those six areas of the hexagon in average. And then the columns, vertically, are the different countries where we run the survey. Wherever you see a strong color, that means that something statistically significant has changed before and after the Olympics. So, for example, I can see two strong red squares. That means that the image has got worse by a margin that is statistically significant. If you see a strong green square, it means it's got better in a way that's statistically significant. So the first thing you notice there is that almost nothing has happened. There are no strong colors apart from those two red ones. There's some sort of middle green, but we're talking about 1%, 2%. It's not really significant. So what are the two uh, changes there? Well, the Brazilians' view of the British government's approach to the environment got significantly worse after the London Olympics than it was before. And the other one, the Turkish panel's view of British culture overall got significantly worse after the London Olympics. Now that's very interesting because Turkey and Brazil are the two countries that are least positive towards uh, Britain uh, every year when we do this. I won't go into the details, but I promise you that's the case. And when we do something to show how wonderful we are, all it does is remind them how much they hate us. <laughs> and it gives them new reasons to uh, think worse of us than before. 
And that's kind of interesting, isn't it? So even the Olympics did nothing. I mean, if you think about it, it's logical. Because what did people think about Britain and London before the Olympics? They thought, okay, Britain is a, a modern, wealthy, progressive, creative kind of country, well-organized. They're the sort of people who could put on a really, really good event, right? And then you put on a really, really good event, why would they change their minds? You know, you've just proved the truth of what they always believed. You have reinforced their prejudices. Did the World Cup improve South Africa? Well, there's a lot of strong red there. The simple answer is that the World Cup seriously damaged the image of South Africa. Why? It was a success, surely. Everybody said nothing went wrong, everybody had fun, a lot of football was played, nobody died. So what's the problem? Well, the problem was that South Africa had basically been telling the world since the end of apartheid that it was now a fully developed, fully prosperous, fully progressive Western European nation. And then when the World Cup came along, people around the world saw hours and hours and hours of TV showing them exactly what South Africa really looked like outside the stadiums because they've got to fill hours of television time and all the poverty and the contrast between the rich parts of Johannesburg and the poor suburbs. And people all around the world looked at those images and they said, my God, South Africa's in Africa. <laughs> and so they corrected their perception of South Africa dramatically downwards. And I've made one true prediction in my entire career about this index. I predicted that the same thing was going to happen to Brazil after the World Cup for exactly the same reasons. Everybody thinks that Brazil is a much more developed country than it really is. And the first time they saw what it was really like, they were quite shocked and they corrected the image downwards. And just in case the world didn't get the message, they've now got the Olympics to really hammer home the message. <laughs> okay, so here's the overall ranking. This is 2008 when GFK um, teamed up with me to do it. As you can see, Hungary ranks 28th. Now, the overall ranking doesn't mean a lot because as you've seen, there are lots of individual questions. So this is the average of an average of an average of an average, but what the most of the world thinks on average about these 50 countries, as you can see, Hungary sort of around about the middle. Now, it's only 50 countries, so that doesn't mean it's in the middle of all the countries on Earth, but of the 50 that I measure, that's pretty good. And perhaps some of you are feeling happy that it's above Poland and the Czech Republic because I know there is a tendency amongst human beings to compare yourself with your neighbors. Um, and Germany was number one above America, which doesn't often happen. 2009, Hungary dropped from 28th to 29th. Well, don't get excited. Actually, it didn't drop at all. It was only because we included a new country above it and it pushed it down. That's the trouble with <laughs> rankings. The score remained exactly the same. 2010, yeah, it stayed there. 2011, mm, okay, still there. Uh, 2012, <gasps> it's gone down. No, it hasn't. <laughs> we included a new country above it. 213, oh, gone up. Actually, no, it hasn't. We took out the country that we included. <laughs> so <laughs> that is pretty much where you stand in the hierarchy of nations. Um, 214, oh, 28. 200, uh, I can't include very much data here because we've only just produced these, but you appear to have gone down again. The interesting thing is that actually Poland and the Czech Republic have now overtaken you, and that is significant. That does mean something. What? I'm not sure. That would be a very, very long discussion, which we can't do right now. Okay, so then you can plot the images of the countries on a hexagon and see what their image looks like. This is what America looks like. It's incredibly strong on everything except governance, where it's typically quite unpopular. But it goes in and out, depending on who's in the White House and what their foreign policy is at any given moment. There's Italy. Italy is a classic soft hexagon. All of its strengths are in soft areas like tourism, people, and culture. And yet it's perceived to be weak on the hard areas like immigration, exports, and of course governance where, to be honest, it is quite weak. And there's Germany, which is exactly the opposite. Germany has got a hard hexagon, it's perceived to have strengths in the top area, and it's perceived to be weak in the others, which to me seems bizarre. I mean, you know, why should culture not be strong for Germany? Why should tourism not be strong? Why should people not be strong for Germany? But that's the perception. And as you can see, they are pretty much opposites of each other. At one stage, I did suggest to Silvio Berlusconi and Angela Merkel that if they were to merge their two countries, it would create the perfect national image. But they pointed out to me that that had been tried once before and it wasn't a huge success. 
And here's, here's Britain. Well, isn't that just the most perfect hexagon any of us are ever going to see? How we deserve this, I simply don't know. It seems that whenever we go invading other people's countries with the Americans, they get uh, penalized for it, and we don't. I, I would love to know the secret of that trick. And there's France, which would be perfect if it wasn't for the French. <laughs> <coughs> it's funny how these, you see these cliches mirrored in, in the research. There's obviously some, uh, some truth to them. Here's Hungary. Um, as you can see, once you start getting into the countries halfway down the index, the shapes are a good deal smaller. But you can see that this is more, it more closely resembles Germany than Italy. So Hungary is more closely associated with um, the hard factors than with the soft factors. Now that's mainly because they don't know anything about the soft factors. Those people around the world who we've spoken to know almost nothing about Hungary. If they know anything at all, they know that you're a member of the European Union, and that immediately gives every country a huge boost in the top, particularly in governance. I've seen this over and over again. You get a bonus of about five to six ranks in the Nation Brands Index simply by joining the European Union, which is a pretty remarkable effect. And then we look at some developing countries. This is India, very weak on governance. Uh, this is China, looking quite weird. Um, very strong on culture, very weak on governance because everybody has a picture postcard in their mind of every country. And the postcard we have in our mind of China, most of us, is still the guy standing in front of the tank in Tiananmen Square. Um, and so that's why China comes nearly bottom. The reason why China's results overall are very depressed is partly, significantly, because every single Japanese respondent places China bottom, 50th, in every single question in the index. So there's a sort of a protest vote going on there. There's Brazil, which is very similar to Italy, it's just smaller. Um, and there's Iran. Now, the reason why I include Iran is because um, this is um, a very significant tragedy. And it's a significant tragedy for the simple reason that Iran doesn't deserve to be that small by any means. If you look particularly at the question of Iran's cultural heritage, this table shows you how each of these countries ranks Iran on cultural heritage, just that one question. So you can see, for example, at the top, the people in Argentina rank Iran 42nd out of 50 for cultural heritage. Down at the bottom, the United States, they rank Iran 48th out of 50 for cultural heritage. Iran, the birthplace of Western civilization, 5,000 years of continuous cultural production, and the Americans think it has less cultural heritage than Canada, a country that was invented last Thursday. So this just shows what the untiring efforts of two men can achieve. I speak of Mahmoud Ahmadinejad and George W. Bush. That can happen to anybody. Um, I'm going to skip, otherwise I'm not going to allow myself enough time to talk about the really interesting stuff. This is just one that shows the gap between perception and reality, which is kind of interesting. This one's on climate change. Everybody believes that Canada is very green because it has a lot of conifers and snow, and they believe that Angola uh, is not green because it's in Africa, and so it can't be. And it's exactly the other way around. So Angola is ranked 44 places below where it deserves to be, and Canada is ranked 39 places above where it deserves to be. So those differences between perception and reality can be really cruel. Here's the second index. This is the City Brands Index, which I started doing in the same year. We measure slightly different things when it comes to cities, because cities are real places, unlike nations, which are basically the inventions of tyrants. Um, and we're measuring slightly different things, but the survey works in exactly the same way. And Budapest comes 38th. That doesn't mean that uh, you are lower in the City Brands Index than the Nation Brands Index, because in the City Brands Index, it's an even more random collection of cities. There are more cities than nations on Earth, and we have to pick 50, because otherwise the survey becomes impossibly expensive to run. So. The second index came about this way. After I'd been uh, running the Nation Brands Index for many years, um, lots and lots of the governments I was advising were starting to say to me, OK, we understand that what you say, that it's not possible to manipulate the image of our country by messages, by propaganda. But there must be some way of doing it. There must be some way that we can improve our brand, because we need it. We need more trade. We need more tourism. What can we do? 
And I found that I didn't really have an answer to that question. So in 2012, I decided I was going to take a year off and I was going to start exploring those 300 billion data points and see if they could tell me the great mystery, really, in all of this, which is why do people prefer one country rather than another? It's nothing to do with their messages. It must be something to do with reality. And so I spent a year, and it ended up being two years, trying to ask this huge database, why do people prefer one country more than another? Why do they think that Hungary was better than the Czech Republic five years ago, and now they think the Czech Republic is better than Hungary? Where does that actually come from? And the model that came out of it was basically this one. It turns out that there are five main reasons why people admire countries. The first one, morality. Is this country good or bad? Now, what they mean by that is they mean, is it a country that I should feel glad that it exists, that it has a positive effect on the world, that it does good around the place? Or is it bad? Is it dangerous? Is it not a good member of the international community? That's what they mean. You'll notice these are all very simple. When we're talking about public opinion, particularly international public opinion, we are talking about a seven-year-old. And I know because I've measured it. The average mental age of the world's population is about seven and a half. You're just going to have to take my word for that because I've only got 45 minutes to talk through this. Aesthetics. Is it beautiful or ugly? All of us, or at least those of us who are sighted, we see the world in visual terms more than anything else. And if we think a country is beautiful, we will start to believe all kinds of things about it simply as a consequence of that perception of beauty. What I said a moment ago, it's true. I wasn't joking. The reason why people think that Canada is an environmentally friendly country is because they think it's got beautiful landscape. This is a seven-year-old, right? Relevance. What has this country got to do with me? Now, if I asked you to think for a moment about Paraguay, right, you would probably have a range of different views about Paraguay, but very few of you probably would think that it has any real significance on your life, unless it happens to be a country where your daughter is studying or where your husband comes from. But most of the time, the relevance of the country to us is a really significant factor. And it's a question you've got to ask. Why should I expect everybody in the world to think about, to admire, to like Hungary? Do I think about, admire, and like their country? This is a really important question to ask. I get countries asking me this question all the time. Um, they say, but we want to be, uh, I go to, I don't know, Paraguay, and they say, we want to be famous in Greenland, we want to be famous in South Korea, we want to be famous in New Zealand. And I say, well, how many hours a day do you spend in Paraguay thinking about Greenland or South Korea? And the fact is they don't. That they expect themselves to be more relevant to other people than they are. Well, it just doesn't work like that. Strength. This is um, very closely associated with Joseph Nye's uh, um, philosophy of, uh, of um, soft power and hard power. This is hard power. This is about whether the country has actually got economic strength, military strength, territorial strength, a large population. Can they impose their will? And finally, sophistication, which is very important to people. Does this country have smartphones? Or are people still plowing the fields with oxen? And that means something to people. Now, the really interesting thing, those are basically the five drivers. So in people's minds, when they're thinking about foreign countries, those are the attributes that they are calculating in fractions of a second. But the most interesting thing about this discovery, and it was really a life-changing one for me, was when I ran the numbers and I discovered that by an enormous margin, the first one was the most important one that actually people cared more about whether countries were a contributor to humanity or not than anything else. I'm not a cynic, I hope, but I wasn't expecting that. I expected that people would like countries that were strong or beautiful or successful or powerful or rich or something like that. But no, the countries we admire are the countries that we feel we can trust. Everybody admires Norway. Norway has an image which is way out of proportion to its real geopolitical significance, to its real economy. But everybody thinks it's really, really good. Why? Because when we go to bed at night, we aren't afraid to sleep because we think we'll be woken up by Norwegian terrorists around our bed at 3 a.m. No? But there are other countries, like Russia, for example, where people, a lot of people, not everybody by, all, by any means, 
they think that Russia is somehow a negative element in the world order. They're afraid of it. They don't know what it's going to do next. Not everybody by any means, by the way. If I had another hour, I could talk to you about Russia. But that seems to be the point. So the discovery is that people like good countries. And therefore, if you want a better image, there's only one way to achieve it, and that's by doing things that make people feel glad that you exist. In other words, doing something for them. And this was the <laughs> extraordinary discovery, which was so obvious it had been staring me in the face since the very, very beginning. What is the first rule of marketing? The first rule of marketing is that you don't brag about how fantastic your product is. What you do is you get to know your consumer and you find out what their needs are. And it's exactly the same for countries. Governments who spend millions of dollars or euros telling everybody how fantastic they are are simply wasting their money because nobody cares. By definition, all those people have got a perfectly good country of their own. They're not in the market for a new one. They don't care how successful you are. They don't care how wonderful or beautiful you are. Unless you're doing a tourism campaign, that's totally different. I'm not talking about tourism here. They don't care how successful you are. What they care about is what you've done for them this week. So, if a country wants to be admired, it has to become admirable. And if you're not admired, by definition, it's because you've never given people a reason to admire you. So this is about policy. This isn't about words or images. And so, as is traditional with me at this point, I felt an index coming along. So in 2014, I launched the Good Country Index. This is not a measure of perception. This is a measure of reality. What we did was we took 35 data sets, mainly from the United Nations, that actually measure what countries do to the rest of the world. It doesn't measure what countries do domestically. There are hundreds of indexes already that can tell you what such a country does to its own people. Transparency, productivity, the rule of law, internet connectivity, and all of those things. But they all measure countries as if they were islands, as if they were separate entities unconnected with the rest of the world. But we live in the age of globalization. It's not true. Everything you do has an impact on everything else and everybody else. So for the first time, we have some measure of what each country on Earth actually contributes to the rest of humanity outside its own borders. And this is incredibly important because we live in an age of gigantic global challenges, like climate change, like human rights abuses, like migration, like pandemics, like landmines, like nuclear proliferation, like economic chaos. All of these catastrophes going on all the time, all of those problems are far too big for any country to solve on their own. Hungary can't solve the migration crisis. Italy can't solve the migration crisis. China can't solve climate change. America can't solve the economic, the global economic crisis. Mexico can't solve drug trafficking. None of us can solve any problems anymore because they're too big and they're too globalized. The only way that humanity will survive is if we learn to collaborate and cooperate much more. But we don't. And why don't we? Because the world is still organized in nation states which still spend all of their time and energy figuring out how to compete against each other. Just exactly as if it was still the Treaty of Westphalia in 1687, 17th century. Countries have not changed their basic attitude towards the world that they live in for 400 years. It's still all about national competition. When we send our politicians out to a COP20 or a United Nations summit or, uh, or a, a, a G20 meeting, we don't send them out there to fix the problems of humanity. We send them out there to get the best deal for us, don't we? We say, don't come back unless you've got the best deal for your people. Every politician on earth thinks that that's their duty to do the best for their own people and their own territory. And because nations are selfish, but problems are global, that's the big problem. And what the Good Country Index tries to do is it tries to get people to start thinking in this way. Not how well are you doing, but what are you doing? What are you doing for the rest of us? Ireland is the goodest country on Earth. Relative to the size of its economy, it contributes more to the planet and to humanity than any other country. Apart from New Zealand, which I think should join the European Union immediately, all of the other countries in the top 10 are European countries. Why is that? Because the European Union is the noblest experiment in the history of humanity. 
This is the only time that a, a, a number of nation states have had the wisdom and the intelligence and the maturity to give away a tiny part of their own sovereignty for the greater good. It's an absolutely brilliant thing to have done. It's the greatest moment in human history. In execution, of course it isn't perfect. Of course it's corrupt. Of course it's chaotic. Of course it's disorganized. It's run in Brussels. But we're dealing with human beings here. What do you expect? The simple fact of the matter is that it's the best thing that humanity has ever, ever done. Because it works. It's a daily miracle. Every single day, Europe is working around us. What Europe must do now, very urgently, is recognize, of course, that the migration crisis is an existential challenge for Europe. It is the making of Europe. The original making of Europe was the Second World War. The migration crisis, which is going to get worse and worse and worse and worse, will be the making of the European Union if it chooses it, because it's a crisis as big as the Second World War, as important as the Second World War, as critical to global peace and security as the Second World War, and only the European Union can manage it if it takes it seriously, and if it remembers what it's really all about. Then we can do it, and then Europe will find probably that a lot of its problems disappear, because it will have rediscovered its fundamental purpose. At the moment, it's lost its fundamental purpose. It needs a new one, here it is. Let's just hope that it takes it. Because the little blip in migration, I know it doesn't feel like a little blip in Budapest at the moment, but the little blip in migration which is caused by the civil war in Syria is only a tiny little foretaste of what we're going to see. Because down the road, not caused by civil war, but caused by climate change, is going to be 10,000 times the migration. This is Europe's challenge. Is it going to rise to it? Well, that's why Europe is at the top, because we have this habit of collaborating, and we're very good at it. And the Nordics are particularly collaborative within the European Union, which is why they also feature so strongly. And then what you can do is you can look at um, the individual countries. This is online. It's very easy to get to. There's the web address is at the bottom there, goodcountry.org. Um, and you can look at all of the individual um, indicators there which give each country its ranking. I won't spend any time on that because you can look at yourself. This is China, which is near the bottom. <coughs> Not a criticism of China. It's been very busy looking after 1.2 billion people for the last several decades. But we must hope that China will start to recognize that it has a global responsibility as well because we need China. And here's Hungary uh, in 61st position, a pretty good showing out of 125. Um, yes, you are just one place below Moldova, but you are one place above Serbia, so things could be worse. Two places below Uganda and two places above Tanzania. I think one of the things that this shows is that it's actually got very little to do with money. Being a good country has got more to do with attitude and recognizing your international obligations than how much money you spend on aid and development. It's really got very little to do with that. This is a subject which appears to have resonance. I gave a TED talk about it last year, which to everybody's surprise, and my surprise more than anybody else, hit two million views very quickly. Normally, TED talks that complain about the state of the world get 300 views. So I've done a little um, calculation um, which shows, I'm just gonna stop on that slide for a moment, um, which shows, it asks the question, how many people in the world agree with me about the need for politicians to recognize that they now have a responsibility to everybody on the planet and not just for their own country. Well, the research suggests that, that it's about 10% of the world's population. 700 million people, which is a very large number of people around the world, believe that actually global issues are more important than domestic issues. They're also getting a bit fed up with domestic national politics, which they're increasingly finding very narrow and very provincial. And they're also primarily wondering who's looking after the world for our children and our grandchildren. Those 700 million people are the people who I hope are going to help spread this idea that actually what we want these days is not prosperous countries, not competitive countries, not economic growth nearly as much as cooperation and collaboration. In other words, good countries. There's no question that human beings have got two competing elements in their nature. We are a bit selfish, but we are also hugely empathetic. We are generous and we are selfish. We are competitive, but we're also collaborative. And there comes a time in the history of humanity when you have to push up 
the cooperation and the collaboration, and you have to turn down the competition a tiny bit. That time has now come, and we need to help get the message out. So I just want to finish off with an answer to the question I asked myself, which is, is it actually possible to change the image of a country with this approach? And the answer is, possibly, it is. This is what normally happens if you do nothing. Malaysia and the Czech Republic, two countries picked at random from the Nation Brands Index between 2009 and 2012, as you can see, that familiar flat line, the patient is dead, right? Nothing has happened. The only difference between the two is that Malaysia spent a gigantic amount of money on nation branding, Malaysia truly Asia, and the Czech Republic spent absolutely nothing, and it made no difference whatsoever. Here's what happens if your image is declining. Between 2008 and 2012, or in the case of Egypt, 2009 to 2012, those were two countries whose images were on the way down. Italy, because it's slightly going out of fashion, for reasons I can't go into. Egypt, mainly for security reasons. The difference between them, Italy spent nothing because they think that God will rescue them. Egypt spent an enormous amount of money. Either way, it made absolutely no difference at all. But here are two countries that I'm particularly proud of because I've worked with them for a long, long time who instead adopted the principle of trying to make themselves admirable and to do good in their neighborhood and further abroad. South Korea started taking a principled and active role in regional affairs. Its voice started to be heard on the question of North Korea. It started demanding and getting a seat at the table in international negotiations. It quadrupled its foreign aid budget. It started making major, major efforts towards energy conservation. It started turning Seoul, its capital city, into the greenest city and the most livable megacity in the region. And you can see that its image has just gone up and up and up. Chile, a similar story, which I haven't got time to tell you in detail, but there's one particular incident or uh, initiative which you may recall, which is called Startup Chile. It's typical for many of the initiatives that we created in Chile, where they're now bringing in entrepreneurs from the United States to set up their businesses in Chile, and it's working incredibly well. About 100 similar initiatives, and as you do that, gradually, you begin to discover, yes, you can change your image. How do you do it? Not by doing well, but by doing good. Thank you very much for your patience.